nature to me is, is life. Humans depend on, on, on nature to exist. So nature is very, very, very important to us. Landing in Dominica is like landing in Jurassic Park, you know. <laughs> the island is beautiful, lush green forests, you know, crystal clear water. Dominica is a breathtaking country, mountainous. It is different from the other Caribbean islands. Yeah, Dominica is an amazing place. Uh, it's an amazingly beautiful place. Uh, it's one of the few islands in the Caribbean that are, uh, I would call, pristine. Well, Dominica is untouched, Dominica is unspoiled, so anybody who come here would actually love you. My name is Harold Gist. I am presently the Maritime Administrator for Dominica, and then uh, I am the President of the Dominica Sea Turtle Conservation Association. So we work, we work with turtles uh, for conservation of, of turtle species that nest in, in the beaches of Dominica. My name is Jake Levinson. I'm the executive director and co-founder of an organization known as Oceans Forward, a conservation organization designed to support conservation in places like Dominica. What makes Dominica incredibly unique is the diversity of ecological habitats that you have here. You can have the rough waters of the Atlantic on the eastern seashore. Uh, you can have uh, high peaks with uh, rainforests and, uh, and you know, 300 some inches of rain a year. Uh, and you can have the calm waters of the Caribbean Sea, like what's behind me right now, uh, and the beautiful coral reefs there. So there's really a remarkable diversity of natural beauty here. Hey, I'm Stephen Duran. I am a naturalist. Yeah, and I love all nature. I work with the Forestry, Wildlife and Parks Division, responsible for research and monitoring and environmental education. And I'm also engaged with Domset Crew, I'm one of the board. I have been a part of, you know, this whole, you know, how, how do I call it? It's a revolution, you know, it's, it's, it's a commitment to uh, protect sea turtles in Dominica. As we are aware, all sea turtles are now in danger. And so Dominica has its role to play as well in, in terms of protecting sea turtles. We have about five species in our waters, uh, three of them nesting on our beaches. When we first bought the property, I went back to Minnesota and Oscar called me, he's all excited. He says, there's turtles nesting on the beach. We had no idea. And he called me two days later and said, they're all being poached. <laughs> and they were sleeping on the beach and taking every turtle that came. Persons in Dominica have always uh, consumed turtle. And turtle have always been in abundance. But a lot of things have changed around this island. We have a lot, of, a lot more marine traffic now. We have a lot more uh, increase in fishing activity now. There is a lot more garbage, pollution, plastics that go into the ocean now. So there are many uh, challenges that are adverse to the survival of the turtles. So you have, uh, you have some of these challenges. But um, we are resolute, we, we are determined to, 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 to save the species. Well, the challenges that we face basically are, well, you, you know, we are experiencing climate change. Uh, this is the new normal now. It is, it is here to stay. It is happening now as we speak. We are experiencing sea level rise. And one of the things with, 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 with climate change is that small, small islands tend to be the temperature gauge by which this, this, the impacts and effects of climate change is measured.
Hurricane Maria came ashore as a Category 5 in September, and uh, really Dominicans have no place to go when it's uh, in, in a storm. Uh, every community has a shelter, but uh, their houses and, and uh, everything else is really susceptible to climate change. You can see by the way the villages up here that um, it's just it's inches between the sea on a normal day and people's front, front doors. And when storm surge comes in, or even a, a bad uh, tropical storm, let alone a hurricane, uh, a lot of this is underwater. A lot of this area that we're driving through right now is underwater. A category five storm is not something anyone wants to experience. It is a very horrible situation. It begins lightly, slowly, and then over two, three, four hours later, it can be very terrifying. Your house where you are is just being ripped apart. And, uh, you know, you might hear screams and it's just a very horrible situation. And if you're a poor country and it comes right over you, chances are your life is pretty much shattered and you want, you have to start again. So that's what I would say about a, a, a category five. I mean, this one, we were not expecting a category five. It's a really, uh difficult situation. Uh, Dominica really is on the, on the front lines of climate change. You know, the Prime Minister had this great saying uh, when he spoke in front of the UN uh, the week after Maria, or just a few days after Maria, uh, and said, uh, I come to you from the front lines of a, of a battle we did not start, a war that we did not start, but one that we must fight. And uh, they're right. Uh, Dominica didn't have a huge global role in climate change, but yet these are the people that are suffering the consequences of development of other countries. I was alone, you know, in, in a building right here at Rosalie. And uh, the noise is probably the most terrifying thing. It blows very loud. Boost your windows, smash your windows, smash your doors. And you're wondering whether your house is going to be crumbling on top of you. For sure, you're not going to go outside. If you have to die, you'll die inside. <laughs> your mind will not tell you to go outside. Because outside is death. It's unimaginable, and to many of us who live through it, it's still unimaginable because you didn't face it. You didn't go out and, and experience it. You were hidden in a hole, hidden in a bathroom, sitting in a toilet, lying in a bathtub. My wife and I wrapped in a mattress and you know, while our house was completely destroyed. We all had trauma. Then you wake up and I think the trauma of waking up and seeing what's happened to your community and to your environment where there are no mangoes, there are no coconut trees. We didn't have coconuts on this island for over a year. We didn't have bananas for over a year. All those things that is part of what we lived on a day-to-day -day basis is just erased, is gone. So you never see these parrots when there's ample coverage, uh, ample ground cover. You never see these guys, but now you see them everywhere. People think that it's because of a lack of food. And there it goes. I just want to erase it from my mind because, you know, there are some photos that I refused to take because it was too bad. Bodies are here, bodies are there. Things are smashed. You don't want to take that photo because you don't want to remember. You don't want to remember that. The challenge of something like Hurricane Maria is in your face, catastrophic. But on the other side of it is that this far down, we've all changed. We all now appreciate what we have so much more. 
we're all more open to new ideas. We're more realizing that we need to protect what we have. Um, things like solar energy, people were not against solar energy, but they, what's the point? We didn't have electricity in this community for 10 months. Attitudes have changed. Everybody is more open to new ideas. Everyone's open to coral restoration, solar energy, uh, resiliency in your water supply, resiliency in your food supply, all of these things. And also the value of community because we, none of us would have survived without this community. Coming together, working together, saving everything, um, giving to your neighbor, working with your neighbor, it, it changed everything. There are quite a bit of other challenges including the pollution on the beach, beaches, pollution in the ocean, the problem with the sagasam weed. Um, this, is, this is something that turtles have to battle. This wave of a profuse amount of, of sagasam that we are now seeing was not the norm. I think this has come with climate change as well. Oh, well, this is a, a, a weed that comes from the Atlantic that um, journeys to the, the Caribbean region on an annual basis. This is uh, a weed that um, really pollutes our beaches and uh, some of our coastal areas. And uh, when that happens, you know, it's, it's really chaotic for some of the nesting turtles. And even turtles that are successful in, in laying eggs, when the hatchlings going out, creates problems for them as well. We, we are seeking to, to adapt to this, to this, to this mass of, of, of seaweed that comes on the beach and it disrupts everything. So, so it's a two-pronged approach. You clear the beach and you also provide a means of, of, of livelihood for the poachers through composting and using it in agriculture and boosting organic farming which can fetch a good price and further provide some level of income to those persons, you know. So we are trying to see how we could make it a win-win situation, you know, because a, a, a poacher can make quite a bit of money from just killing a turtle. So, so you have to give him something and th that is probably a little more than if you were to kill a turtle, you understand. Erica and Maria dumped a lot of debris on, on the beaches and we are seeing changes in beach profile, you know, sometimes the beach profile will change from year to year. And so all of this, you know, are challenges that the, the turtles, you know, have to uh, battle with, as well as problems with um, fisheries, like uh, fishermen taking turtles in nests and spearfishing and, and so forth. We still have people here, and we still have the same feeling and the same concern for the people. And that's why we're building that with the expectation that we will continue. For sure we're continuing the turtle project. We, we have no choice about that one. <laughs> we are now uh, on track to, to establish, or at least building, the first climate resilient nation in the world because we realize that Climate change is here, and it is not going away. In fact, in, in everything we do now, we have to mainstream climate change in our design, not, not, not mitigate anymore. It's planning for climate change uh, effects and impacts. So uh, somebody coming to Dominica will probably get some first-hand pioneering experience on building a climate resilient nation. So come on down. The current state of sea turtles in Dominica is that there are three species and the numbers are declining. We used to have probably up to 70 nesting females a year. It could be as few as 12 now. Uh, the population is, is going down fast. Dominica has three species that nest on its beach. We have the hogsbill, the green turtle, and the leatherback. And this is, this is a great natural resource for us. It used to have a lot of letterbacks coming up and a lot of people used to come up from everywhere and yeah. see it with pictures and everything. It was great. 
The reasons for the declining population could be any number of things, right? You could have the cumulative impacts of things like climate change and shifting food supplies and things like that. But there's also stressors that we can control, like illegal poaching and illegal hunting uh, of sea turtles when they're up on the beach nesting. We, we, are, we have already lost one, which, which is the, the loggerhead. It used to nest in Dominica, and we have not sighted it for many years now. Uh, they, they may have been uh, hunted out, and therefore we are taking the precautionary measures to prevent that from happening to the other free species. When we look and we see, we observe the amount of poaching that was taking place over the, during the turtle season, we came together and we organized Domseco. Before we started the, the conservation aspect of it, we did some educational parts. We went to schools, we went to youth groups. Then we, we start doing monitors on the beach and we start bringing in persons from the neighboring villages to look at the sea turtle, how it come, what it does on the beach and during the season, how it really reacts on the beach. I care a lot about the environment and nature. And turtles really are my passion. Now, we have grown over the years. The main thing is the, is the patrol. If we're not there, other people will be there for a different reason. And even with us being here, they still pose a challenge to us. My name is Chael and I've been there for one year. I started last year and I've been enjoying it because I love turtles and they're so cute and I want to make sure that they're protected from the people that try and murder them. If they keep on taking it, then it will go extinct and we won't have any turtles come up and leave. So we're making sure that they are protected. I am taking care of the turtles on the beach, doing beach this here Point Greenard Beach and Champagne Beach. Turtle come nesting there, so uh, it's my duty to take care of them, protect them from the dogs, poachers as well. Some some people are playing. Some young people, they know the meat. If they not eat that meat, they not strong. The people of Dominica has for a very long time enjoyed um, sea turtle meat. It's it's like a tradition. It's part of the culture. You know, some people feel very strong, you know, they feel it good, especially the men, you know, enjoying sea turtle meat. So quite a number of persons who live in this, this sort of ignorance, you know, and so it makes them aggressive and they will do a lot to, to you know, defy the laws and so on. Well, I expect to meet, to, to meet people, poachers. I expect that, but I'm not all that scared of them because it's, it's people from the from my neighborhood. I mean, Laughlin is small, so we know everybody in Laughlin, but they still do it, they still yeah. come, they still try and attack the turtles. Well, I was, and we was on the beach and it's like, I actually saw the, the person was coming. I flashed my light, I saw him was coming, but the next week he was going to cross the river, so I actually stand up. But when I turn, I saw him running, coming with the cutlass on me. So all the rest of them run, so I stand up. And then he threatened me, saying, oh, he have to kill one of us. Anytime he meets us on the beach again, they'll just, he'll just bury us on the beach. Well, I don't scare me. I don't scare. <laughs> I'm not scared at all. So we saw a, a guy, not, not too far from here, not too far from here. He was walking towards us. When we almost passed him, he, he started to, to run in the river. So no, we don't take that for anything. We, we just say he's probably scared because we are we are coming on the beach. But maybe when we walked up a little a little bit after, we saw uh, the trucks, we, uh, a Hawksville came up. We took our measurements, we did what we had to do, and then we started walking again. A little after we saw where he killed uh, a greenback, which was, which was a little bit too late because he had time to escape. But I saw his face. I made a report to the police, but they, they, didn't, they didn't come soon. 
I have seen a lot of, you know, struggles, battles with coaches and where we had to bring, you know, the police on many occasions to help, you know, fight these people off the beach. People would come out, you know, in large numbers. It's like, like what we refer to a carnival. We just had carnival. Yeah, you'd see that many. I've, I saw that, you know, several occasions. And the people would come and uh, settle on the beach and uh, prepare themselves to take turtles, even though the, the patrollers and persons engaging in turtle protection, uh, and even the police, you know, on, on beaches at, at, during that time. Normally, from the time they see the bright light, they would try to get away. But then they get so bold, they figure, they can confront me with a machete and tell me, shut up my light. That happened to me on that corner of the beach with a poacher who actually chased me off the area with his machete. My bag stayed there. He rubbed my, my equipment and what he wanted out of my bag and so on. I mean, there's some of, some of these activities, if you're not strong, you'd say that's it, you're done. Because you think of your life, you know, you think of the dangers to your life, you know, you think of your family, you probably say, but why am I doing this to save, you know, sea turtles? To be honest, I fear nothing, nothing. Once I come to protect my turtles, I fear nothing. I fear near poachers, neither the, the animals, because I come to protect them. Because I have my children, I have a little boy, two years, I want him to know what's a turtle. I want him to know what's a leather back, I want him to know what's an oxbill and a green back. The law in Dominica say when they get a person that kills a turtle, the person has to pay $400. They say that's not a problem. I have a big turtle, how many pounds? I can make more money than that. It is a form of generating income as well. People make a lot of money. Turtle will probably be like between $15 and $25 a pound. And there are other reasons like exportation even exportation. Turtle meat can be exported to make more money. The fine is very small. If you sell a turtle 2,000 pounds or 1,500 pounds, you make a, a lot of money. We'd like to see change in the laws. Well, actually, Cabinet has already approved the increase in for the fines for poaching turtles. It has moved from 400 EC dollars to $7,500. Cabinet has to take this to Parliament for it to be enacted. And it's probably about seven or more years now. And we're not seeing that. I'm not sure um, this is going to happen. The turtle situation in Dominica is getting very urgent. If the government doesn't do anything about illegal poaching and the catching of sea turtles at sea as a permissible fishery, it's very feasible that Dominica will not see sea turtles in the next five to 10 years. But what I think the, the politicians themselves have to do is to to understand that they're, they're doing something that is important for Dominica. Not just thinking of the, you know, being elected for the next five years, but thinking of Dominica and protecting its, its biodiversity. Just do what they need to do. And, and also looking at something else that we've been asking for, to, to declare nesting beaches as specially protected beaches particularly during the nesting, just for the nesting season. So if all of us can understand, you know, what it is we want to do, having con conservation of sea turtles, not just to ensure that we have turtles for future generations to see and to eat as well, but that we can use sea turtle conservation for rural people to generate incomes like sea turtle watch and all of that you know, to increase tourism activities. It's kind of fascinating to, to, to see them um, laying, because children, they, they love it. Especially the, the baby turtles, oh, the children love it. For us as a dive industry, turtle is one of our most desired things for a diver to see. 
And to be honest, if you go out and you have a dive where not a lot of interesting things are happening, but divers swim with the turtle for five minutes, that's all they're going to talk about the rest of their holiday. I guess when a diver sees a sea turtle, um, you can see them happy. They're like a kid again, I guess. That's a way to describe it, the face reaction, you know? It's a joyful um, reaction. So we used to have people from Sweden come in there very often to look at the sea turtles on the beach. And based on that, we have, we have seen a dramatic decline in the poaching of sea turtle. Because the people them that was really eating it, when they came on the beach and they saw the process, they said, no, I cannot eat that anymore. There's so much value to having turtles nesting that we need to find better ways to protect them and stop the poaching. Uh, we found after Maria that a lot of turtles were coming up right here in this community now for the first time in a long, long time. So I approached uh, Jake from, from Dom Setco and uh, Resilient Dominica is going to work with Dom Setco in putting a patrol program in place to make sure that the nests are well located, well protected and try and play our part within this community of Sufria uh, in protecting our turtles. Dominica is a remarkable place. You can have small actions that can have a big impact. You've got small uh, focused coastal villages. There's a lot that you can do uh, to have a very big impact with little effort. So the three that are left, we want to make sure that they are always there. And we want to maintain this, this uh, biodiversity uh, on the nature island. Well, we don't really catch sea turtles. What we do is we have captures that are organized uh, in a way that we can get the max amount of data from animals that are at sea. Usually we wait for animals to come to us on a nesting beach, but in a lot of cases, animals like males, for example, or juveniles are out at sea. So to understand the, the population and the diversity and the type of population that we have here in Dominica, uh, we want to tag animals at sea too. Clear on the same page of what we're doing and sort of why we're here. Uh, Morrison and Simon are uh, sort of he helping head up some of our... Uh, Turtle, right there. Shut up. Oh my god, you're kidding me. Nice size yeah. turtle. So what we do is we go out with uh, the guys from here at Dive Dominica and we uh, find a turtle, a uh, free swimming turtle, uh, usually hawksbills. We'll capture them, bring them up on the boat, and do all our data work up on the boat there. Uh, so, for example, we'll measure their carapace length, their length. We'll uh, see if they can be identified as male and female, uh, which for juveniles you can't really do. And then we put a satellite tag on. Uh, that allows us to follow the sea turtle in real time and get a, an idea of its behavior and the habitat it uses and where it travels to. If it goes to nearby islands or it stays here in Dominica, uh, then uh, what we'll do is we'll affix flipper tags, which are basically little tags that can get crimped with pliers, sort of like getting your ear pierced uh, in, a, in a sea turtle's flippers. And if that animal is ever caught again, if it's seen nesting again, each one of those flipper tags has a unique identifying number on it. And so we can take that number and identify it back to where we originally put that tag out. My name is Maddie and I'm from Canada and I came to Dominica in January to train freediving. It's a really great place to set up home base and train freediving because of the depth and the warmth. Uh, and the convenience of the platform. And what's made it really magical recently and very surreal is that when we're diving down, we can hear the humpback whale singing. It makes it very bizarre for diving, but it makes it quite addictive because you want to hear them all the time. So today we were working as a team with the scuba divers because the scuba divers go down with tanks so they can breathe. And as a scuba diver, you can't come up quickly. I uh, dove down to 12 meters to get the turtle from the scuba diver and then came up to the surface with her. It didn't know its sex, it's too young to know apparently. Yeah, we're invited out as spotters. And then we arrived today and Jake was like, right, this is how you catch a turtle. We we're like, <laughs> but we did it. <laughs> So the satellite data, data that we have so far is pretty remarkable, and it tells different stories for different species. For the hawksbill sea turtles, the juveniles we've tagged, they stay very close to Dominica and don't go far. Leatherback sea turtles, the, the turtles that we tag on the east coast, 
after they leave here in Dominica, they go north through a very narrow channel. It looks like they all go through the same area. Uh, and they get to about 700 miles south of Iceland. And then they turn south uh, towards the west coast of Africa before the tag finally falls off. They're really remarkable animals. They migrate thousands of miles. They the deepest diving sea turtle. They can dive up to you know 2,000 some feet, and they they have soft shells that allow them to compress at depth. Responsibility is really the conservation, taking care of the turtles, but that involves taking care of the beach, just the, the nesting habitat, and um, taking care of the three species of turtles that come to nest on the beach. Even though you're on the beach, they're not afraid of you. The first set that would just come, like they're coming for the first time, if they see any lights, they would go. But then they, they, we noticed that over the years, those that come more than once for the season, they're not afraid of the light anymore. They would come up and they would stay around you. The, the sun, it comes and goes. So sometimes it might not have a lot of sun in the, in the area where the turtle comes up. So we would normally have stones in the, in, the, in the hole while the turtle is digging. That's so hard for us. Yeah, quite a lot of stones. We ain't falling. We ain't falling. We ain't falling. <laughs> and may have to dig the hole for the leather back. A lot of stones. Yeah. Wet. I, I dig the hole and the they lay, back, lay about 110 eggs. Yeah, wrong I succeed. <laughs> I'm very happy. I work it hard, but I succeed. <laughs> like if you don't dig the hole, it won't lay, yes, so we have lay. to help it out yes. with the hole. Those eggs are very vulnerable. The little bags are huge and sometimes they don't come too far up the beach. And so where they can eventually lay their eggs can be very vulnerable. The ocean can come there, come up, either erode the sand and just wash away the eggs, or sometimes pile up debris over the nest, particularly seaweed. And when the eggs do hatch 70 days after the titus, the baby hatchlings can come up, but they can't overcome the debris that's piled on top of the nest. I've, I've put all the record. How many eggs, the date, yeah. how many small, how many big. Anything you observe about the turtles, everything is documented. Documenting all the activity, nesting activities, keeping track of the turtles. We apply flipper tags so we can trap, trap them and measure them so we can monitor their growth and all of that. Yeah, well, relocating eggs is not a practice that we we do, you know, lightly. We, we do that only in our judgment if it's absolutely necessary. A leatherback has to dig 70 centimeters on average, the chamber, before she can get to the trance and lay the eggs. Sometimes, she can get to the 70 centimeters and does lay the eggs. In other words, the conditions at that spot, at that time, is good. But she doesn't know that, but we do know that a week, two weeks, a month down the road, that spot is not going to remain as it is at the time that she's laying the eggs. You know that. So we take those eggs and take them higher up. Normally we have, we have a, 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 a choice area where we, in fact, we, we, we consider our hatchery. Place the eggs, we put them in a, in a container, then we bring them here, we 
we decide a, a, a spot, we dig the, the, the hole. We dig the hole to the depth, the, the turtle dog it on, on, on the beach. And we put the, the big eggs first. Some big eggs and some small, big, a little bit of small. We've had years operating here. We are the only leatherback hatchlings that made it out to sea successfully for the season were from eggs that we relocated. Eggs that we left, everything got lost. So we take care of the turtles, take care of the eggs and the hatchlings after the hatch. About three years past, yeah. the hatch is full, full of eggs. Yeah. No places to put we, more we eggs. We don't have any more space. Do you know how, how long it'll be until you see whether or not you were successful here? Uh, like, when these hatchlings go off, how do we know we're successful? Um, 20, 25 years. <laughs> right, right. So we don't know oh. that we're successful for. Yeah. And that's the bummer about this is that we'll be old. I'll, I'll be an old man by the time that we. Uh, I'm already an old man. I'll be oh. in my. Please. <laughs> when this year's hatchlings come back, I'll uh, be what? 70? <laughs> oh my god. That's crazy to think about, right? <laughs> don't laugh, dude. That's crazy. Uh, yeah. I don't think about it. When you started this, what? Ten years ago, yeah. right? When you, this is your tenth year doing this. Yes, oh, yes. yes. Okay. I stopped ten years. Okay, so it's ten years. So you still have another, at least ten another years. decade to go another until any years. of your hatchlings come back. Damseco is about more than just sea turtles. We're about ensuring coastal communities' natural ocean resources are protected so that their economies can depend on them reliably for, for generations. Coral reefs are an integral part. It's habitat for sea turtles, and it's also important for scuba diving, for tourists, and for fishing. Well, lionfish is a species that's indigenous to the Red Sea and uh, the Pacific Ocean. Funnily enough, it's a beautiful fish, one of the most beautiful fish in the sea. But uh, they were so beautiful, they started being adopted by the aquarium trade in the United States. They came into Florida, uh, escaped into Florida waters, uh, and then became this massive invasive species throughout the entire Caribbean, Central and South America. What we know about lionfish elsewhere in the world is that when they show up, within 18 months, biodiversity de declines significantly, up to 72% from other studies that we've seen. And so protecting reef diversity in a focused area uh, by removing lionfish is a critical strategy to en ensuring biodiversity is protected. We looked at the other islands or what was happening in other places of the world getting lionfish and the impact on the lionfish on the, on the reefs and so. So Dominica um, and we came together and we reached out to a reef to teach us how to catch lionfish and how to deal with the problem before we got lionfish. They're uh, voracious feeders, they're extremely efficient breeders, they predate everything and they have no predators. So the only way to control them uh, and this has been proved by multiple studies, is one by one hand removal by divers. Scuba divers just dive down with a, with a pole spear and spear them. Lionfish again, they don't hide, they have no predators here, so they're just out, out there feeding, and you can really just go right up to them and, and remove them from a reef. One of the things that I've always been curious about is some sites we will go and, and do a hunt, and we'll go back a week later and there'll be lots of lionfish again. So I wanted to know, are they going deep? So what we did today was we practiced doing a, a uh, operation on a lionfish, so sedating a lionfish uh, and inserting a tracker. So to implant a tag into a lionfish, uh, it's like doing minor surgery. And what we do is we first capture the lionfish using a net very carefully so it doesn't get hurt or anything. We then anesthetize it, we turn it upside down, and we make a small one to two millimeter incision and we can insert a little acoustic tracking tag into it and then we sew it up carefully and the lionfish swim by these acoustic receivers designed to hear the pings that are emanating from the lionfish. That way we can find out are lionfish coming up from deeper reefs once we've cleaned one reef of lionfish or they're coming from reefs to the side and that helps us better uh, make our plans for management on how we remove them from the reefs. We've been very, very effective. I'm pretty proud of what we accomplished here on the island with the assistance of fisheries. Uh, and we really grew the restaurant business to understand that this is just another fish to serve. That's proved really effective. And, and here we are now about seven years into the invasion and uh, restaurants are demanding more and more and more lionfish. And we're getting to the point now where 
on our dive sites, there's not enough lionfish by any means to serve the restaurant uh, industry. So we're going off sites to new locations and trying to eradicate lionfish from, from the entire coastline. Uh, and when I say eradicate, we're never going to win that battle. We're never going to actually eradicate them, but we will be able to at least keep them in a natural balance. We would have, we would see a lot more turtles coming up. People would have more respect for the turtles. They would stop the, the poaching. And more people coming and see the turtles instead of killing the turtles, yeah. you know? The national dish used to be uh, the mountain chicken. The mountain chicken is a, is a frog. And, uh, There's no more frogs. We love what we are doing. It's no money can really pay you for that. It's because we're interested in conservation and we, we love what we're doing. That's the reason why we, we do the job. I think there's a lot of awareness and I don't think we should, we should um, quit. Uh, we should look to do more now. There's a lot more that we can do. Uh, there, there's a lot that we can do differently, you know, doing things differently to uh, have people understand and uh, get involved as well in, in, in what we're doing, to appreciate what we're doing for the conservation. <laughs>